to be very brief, now I introduce the session chair, it's Tanya Singh. Thank you, Arne. So the first speaker uh, today is Oscar Nitratz. Oscar finished his PhD in 1984 at the University of Toronto, and he is currently a professor of computer science at the Institute of Computer Science in the University of Bern, where he he, found, he founded the Software Composition Group in 1994. He is a co-author of more than 200 publications, and among other things, he's the co-author of open source, the open source book Object Oriented Re-Engineering Patterns and Faro by Example. Please welcome Oscar Nisratz. I'm very honored to be here today. I uh, um, especially uh, given my situation. So I've done a lot with a lot of different uh, object-oriented languages over the year, but actually Simula was not one of them. So I apologize in advance if I say something foolish or outright, outright wrong. Uh, please forgive me in advance. What I want to do today is uh, give you a bit of a, I want to give a bit of a historical perspective, but it's a very personal historical perspective. Uh, coming from my own experience. So I wanted to give some highlights over the years of things that I found important and influenced me. I'm sure there are lots of things that I've left out, some on purpose and some out of ignorance, uh, but uh, bear with me, please. So this story, um, it's kind of a saga. I've broken it up into four parts with a little prologue. And the prologue is there because from my point of view, of, for me personally, the story did not start in uh, Norway, but in Canada. Uh, where I uh, started working on a PhD in uh, actually a master's uh, with Dennis Sigritsis at the University of Toronto in 1979. And um, Dennis at the time was working on uh, office information systems, what we called at that time the electronic office or the paperless office. And uh, I was brought in, I started working as a master's student uh, after doing a mathematics degree at the University of uh, Waterloo. And I decided actually the math I was interested in was happening in more in computer science. Um, in Dennis's group in the 1970s, they did a lot of work on relational databases and they built the first uh, relational system for Unix called MRS, Micro Relational System. Then Dennis, who made many career changes over the years, he got more interested in uh, the electronic office, and he had another couple of master's students built. Uh, oh, by the way, MRS eventually turned out to be uh, a product, and I think it's still a, a product today in a very niche market. Then, with a couple of other master's students, they built OFS, which was the office form system. And the idea was here that uh, you could have a distributed collection of uh, nodes where um, users would have uh, graphical very simple graphical representations of office documents, forms, which would be mapped to this relational system. And then when I joined Dennis's group, uh, he gave us this project to build an automated form system, so to add automatic procedures on top of this. So the idea was that uh, users would be able to specify uh, procedures that would be automatically triggered when certain forms would arrive in their inbox, what today would be called a, a workflow system. And he gave this job to me and John Hogue to build this thing. And we thought, great. And we also, by the way, we called it TLA, never told anybody what TLA stood for. There are all these prototypes in the group, like MRS and OFS. We thought, well, we have to have a three-letter acronym. Uh, well, sorry. <laughs> so, we opened up the box. To me, it seemed like this is, should be straightforward. I know exactly what we have to do. Opened up the box and what we saw was like a Jackson Pollock painting. I asked myself, that's me a long time ago, where are the objects? So this stuff was all written in C. And the domain, the lovely domain objects that we had, these office forms, they were nowhere in the code. I couldn't find them. They were smeared all over the place. We built our prototype, but I was felt very, very uncomfortable. Okay, so this is a bit of a prologue. Now the story switches back to Norway. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, so this is part one, where we start seeing the beginnings of object-oriented programming with a couple of different languages. We've already heard and we've seen outside a bit of the history of uh, Simula. I won't tell you too much about it, but some things that really struck me. Uh, particularly, there are a number of very nice uh, historical surveys. That was one that I liked. So, uh, Ole Johan Dahl and Kristen Nigard uh, developed Simula over a number of years. And uh, basically, over a period of four years, they identified, uh, four or five years, they identified a number of fundamental concepts that seemed important to them. So, uh, they uh, as we've heard, they were interested in having better support for building simulation programs, and they found that the current languages, especially ALGO, were not really appropriate. So apparently, one of the first things that, uh, that they felt was problematic was this focus on the stack as the basic data structure in the programming language. And they identified, especially for simulations, that queues were uh, very important for scheduling events, I imagine, and also for, for uh, scheduling processes and, uh, and for messaging. Uh, so this was one of the first abstractions that seemed to be very important. The second thing that emerged over time was the uh, unifying notion of an object. Actually, at the time, they focused on the concept of a process, but we recognize it today as an object or even of classes of objects. So this was the second fundamental concept. And then fairly late in the game, um, they realized they needed some way of sharing or reusing specifications of, uh, uh, of objects, objects bundled together, behavior and attributes, but sometimes you had very similar classes. So this notion of, of layering, or what they called prefixing at the time, allowed one to take an existing specification and add stuff to it, which was pretty cool. And later on, this was called inheritance, but at the time it was referred to as prefixing. Um, now, we've also heard that, well, originally, Simula was intended as providing uh, better support for simulation, but quickly people began to realize hey, this idea of simulation is actually pretty cool, and we can use it for other things. So, you could say, they didn't actually say this, but maybe they could have said it. Uh, to me, they were saying programming is simulation. This is, this is something that's fundamentally important. I think this is a theme that will keep coming backward, back, uh, back again. From my perspective as well, though, simulation is a form of, of modeling. It's saying that we can, if we, want to do, if we want to build any kind of application, we build our own virtual world in software. And this is kind of a model that, uh, that is executable. So you could also say, as far as I know, they didn't say that, but you can read between the lines and say that uh, uh, Ole Johan and Kristen were saying, program, in a sense, is modeling. But what struck me when I was reading uh, about the history is something that Kristen actually did say, which is programming is understanding. And in some sense, I feel that's the same thing. The idea that programming is modeling also is saying that having, having a program where the model is explicit in the code, that really helps you understand not only the program, but how it's related to the application. Okay, this is all pretty cool. Around about the time that uh, Simula 67 was being uh, put together, Alan Kay came along and he noticed that uh, hardware was getting cheaper and faster and more powerful. And he imagined uh, that very soon down the line, uh, you would have computers that people could own themselves. And maybe eventually down the line, computers that people could hold in their hands. Multimedia devices, crazy idea. So that's uh, a mock-up, that's just a piece of cardboard, I think, or a piece of wood, I don't know. That's the mock-up of the Dynabook from, uh, from around 1970. Alan Kay said, you know, if we're going to build this stuff, we can't do it with the existing programming languages and technology. We, we really need this notion of, of objects, but it's not just a programming language issue. This is something fundamental that goes deep. So he wanted to build a system, uh, not, just a, um, not just a programming language, uh, operating system all the way down to the hardware. 
which was uh, codenamed Smalltalk, uh, which would be built object-oriented all the way down. So essentially, he was saying it's objects all the way down. In some versions of this history, uh, legend goes that people would ask him, well, what are the objects made of? And he would say, it's objects. And what are those objects made of? Oh, they're objects again. And what about those objects? And he said, listen, it's objects all the way down until you reach turtles. I don't think he said that, but uh, in one story, it's, it's uh, told that way. In fact, if you do, uh, who here has worked with Smalltalk? Uh, a fair number of people. Uh, if you do program with Smalltalk, you, you, uh, you do get the feeling that it is objects all the way down, and eventually you do bang into the turtles, however. Um, let's see. Now, Another thing that Alan Kay said uh, later on in that article from 1977, which really fits very nicely with, uh, with uh, Nigard and Dahl's vision, is that he really had the sense that computation is simulation. So you wanted to think of uh, any kind of computation as a set of interacting objects. Uh, they're, they're actually uh, simulating something. Um, I found on the website uh, of uh, eulogies to uh, Krista Nigard, there was also a comment by Alan Kay, and he said that uh, he had met with Ole Johan Dahl and explained his ideas, and met with dead silence. He said the feeling he was very unhappy and felt uncomfortable about this, that they didn't seem to understand his ideas. And at a later time, he met with Krista Nigard, and explained his ideas, and immediately Chris was like, oh yeah, and you do that, and you do that. It's like he was anticipating what he was going to say. So I, th I found that very interesting and touching. Um, Dan Ingalls was one of the people who has been working with Smalltalk for many years and still is, was one of the architects of really the, the guts of the system. He also likes to say that programming is objects talking to objects. He really uh, believes in this metaphor that, that you want to think at a deep level that an object-oriented system is, uh, you want to think of it in terms of this interaction of objects sending messages to each other. Oh, it's really objects all the way down. Maybe that it's the only picture that I could find that evokes that to some extent. Interestingly enough, Adel Goldberg, who was also uh, working on Smalltalk more or less from the beginning, and was one of the architects of the, of the language, she said, in small talk, everything happens somewhere else. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? So if you have programmed with small talk, sometimes if you're trying to understand a piece of code that uh, somebody else has written, or maybe even some code that you've written yourself, you start following the message and bouncing back. So where is it actually happening? You say, okay, this object says, okay, please, says to another object, please do that. So says, oh, okay, that object must do it. You look at that object and you look at its method and say, no, it's talking to other objects. So you keep following the trail and at some point you get lost. Um, so when you try to understand a complex oriented system, sometimes you can get lost. On the other hand, there's a very positive side to this if you can, if you can get into the Zen of it. And fundamentally behind this statement is the intuition, the, the insight that Delegation is one of the fundamental concepts of good object-oriented design. You aren't the, uh, the, the master of the universe where you say everything that has to be done. It's not programs or algorithms plus data. You don't control everything. You have your data that you're responsible for, and when you want something done, you find the object that has that data, has those responsibilities, and you kindly ask that object to do it for you. Objects talking to objects. Everything happens somewhere else. That other object then has to take care of it. Um, in terms of understanding, I think there's another um, a nice quote from uh, Alan Knight, who's a longtime Smalltalk programmer. He said that uh, one of the great leaps in object orientation is to be able to answer the question, how does this work, with, I don't care. Uh, I think there's a lot of insight that. It's a strange statement, but if you think about it, it's, uh, there's uh, a lot going on there. Okay. Well, 
1981, there was a very influential uh, issue of Byte magazine, uh, all about small talk. Who remembers when that came out? Yeah, a bunch of people. I had I lost my copy. I had a copy for many years. When I got that in my hot little hands, I said, uh, 1981. Yep. <laughs> uh, on the PDF, there's actually a download link. You can actually get the whole uh, PDF of the, of the volume. I think it was August 1981, but there I'm not sure. It was about Smalltalk 80. So the language that they uh, presented was Smalltalk 80, but the bite issue came out the following year. Um, when I saw that, I got excited. I said, oh, wow, this is what I'm looking for. This is what we need. We need some language that allows us to express domain objects in the code where we can make this link all the way down. And I read that and I saw all about the prototypes and then I got disappointed. It ran on something called a Dorado. I had no idea what that was. And uh, I said, well, we'd love to use object-oriented languages, but we don't have any compilers for any of them, any tools, nothing that will run on the hardware we have. So I went and talked to Dennis about this, and he said, well, why don't you grab his typical solution? Why don't you grab a couple of master students and implement an object-oriented language? So that's another story that I don't want to go into today, but that's more or less where uh, my story here ends. Um, but uh, what I want to tell you now about is uh, some other stories related to what happened in the years after that, other things that I found very interesting and influential. So now we enter the golden age. So the golden age is where all sorts of new object-oriented languages and ideas were being developed and was a very fruitful period of time. Uh, so around 1979, uh, Bjarne Stroustrup was encountering a very similar problem that uh, Dahl and Nigar did in the, in the 60s. He had to build a bunch of simulation applications at uh, Bell Labs. And uh, he was an old time Simula programmer and thought, oh gee, it would be nice to have Simula, but I don't have a Simula compiler for these machines. And we're doing everything with C. Well, why don't I do what Dahl and Nigar did? Is I just add objects and classes and inheritance to C. Should be pretty easy to do. So he did that. He, uh, he basically used uh, uh, macros to develop the first version called uh, C with classes. And basically he said, object-oriented programming is programming using inheritance. Uh, and in this paper from eCoop 87, which you can also find online, he summarized object-oriented programming for from his point of view, uh, as being an approach in which you decide which classes you want, provide a full set of operations, and make commonality explicit using inheritance. Well, that's pretty down to earth. So, I mean, it's a very nicely defined chopped up. This is what object-oriented programming is. It's a little bit different from what we were hearing from, uh, from the small talk guys, but okay, it's not entirely incompatible. However, when you ask Bjarne if C++ is an object-oriented language, he says, no, it's not designed as an object-oriented language. It's a multi-paradigm language. You can program in an object-oriented way with C++, but you don't have to. So in fact, it supports a lot of features which support different styles of programming, particularly generative programming with the help of templates. Um, Yes, there's a nice book based on the PhD thesis of James Copeline on uh, this whole aspect of that multi-paradigm programming design for C++. Now, moving ahead, what else? Now we're skipping ahead to 1985. Um, and uh, so and during the 80s, there were a lot of things happening. Uh, this is one of the things I found particularly influential. So. Um, Bertrand Meyer introduced the Eiffel language uh, with a variety of interesting features, but I think the most fundamental and most influential of those was the idea of design by contract. So Eiffel was designed in such a way that it actually had syntactic features supporting design by contract, but uh, people realized this is actually uh, can be supported in uh, 
fairly straightforward way in other languages is simply by the addition of assertions. So it's on the one hand a mechanism, but on the other hand uh, a methodology in which every object has a clearly defined contract uh, that, that uh, formalizes what services under what condition it provides to other objects in terms of preconditions, postconditions, and also invariants, which explain what are the, the actual valid states of the object. Uh, I would, uh, very interestingly, I would think virtually every mainstream object-oriented language and also non-mainstream ones provide some support for design by contract now. So this is something that's, uh, that's pretty much accepted as, uh, as sound methodology. Also, in that book, Bertrand Meyer had a somewhat different view of what object-oriented programming is. In fact, he didn't just talk about programming, but object-oriented software construction. So he's not just thinking about the language, but about the software engineering aspects of object-oriented programming. And he said, object-oriented software composition is based on the objects that are manipulated rather than the functions performed. Now, why is this profound? It's profound because if you look at applications that evolve over time, and any useful application does evolve, well, what is it that changes? It's the functions, the features. They're not stable, they change. What is it that stays stable? Pretty much the domain concepts, the objects. So if you build your application in a functional way around the functions, you can expect it to be less stable. Uh, as it evolves over time, whereas you build it around the objects, you can expect more stability. It's hard to prove, I mean, to carry out uh, an empirical study to, to prove this, but I think you can see that uh, object-oriented, uh, since people got excited about using object-oriented uh, development in industrial projects since the 80s, we've seen uh, object-oriented systems that have grown and grown and been, uh, have evolved over many, many years. Uh, uh, without having to be uh, thrown away and started over again. So I think uh, there's pretty much acceptance in industry that this idea of stability that comes from object-oriented design uh, really pans out. So I think this insight uh, was right on the mark. Okay. Then, during the 80s and 90s, lots and lots of languages were developed. i just list a few of them here. So we had uh, CLOST, which uh, added uh, objects to Common Lisp. Uh, we had Objective C, which uh, took a different approach to extending C with objects, basically by adding Smalltalk style message passing. We had languages like Beta, which were tried to reinvent the basic concepts of Simula by reducing to, to uh, fundamental concepts, in this case, the notion of a pattern. Um, we have languages like Python that grew out of scripting uh, and uh, languages like Self, which tried to be a next generation small talk by reducing the basic concepts of inheritance and classes and reducing them to prototypes and delegation. And of course we have Java. Um, and then dozens and dozens of other languages developed over the years. So, why so many languages? And what's the basic idea of object-oriented programming? So, people started thinking about this. What's actually going on here? And Peter Wagner wrote, a very, wrote an influential paper in the, uh, in the 80s. That was Uppsala 87 there. Go away. Um, and he essentially said, well, if you look at all the languages, the fundamental concepts, if we want to distinguish what's an object-oriented language and what is not, well, an O language should have objects and classes and inheritance. And he went further on to distinguish object-based and class-based and object-oriented. So some languages have objects but don't have classes, some have classes but don't have an inheritance, and then you have the, uh, the full Monty. Uh, and then he further tried to an analyze inheritance and uh, also put delegation in the tree here, so you can see there's a large number of different uh, variations. In fact, if you look at UML, you have this one concept, which is specialization, uh, which is modeled in different object-oriented languages by inheritance, but every single object-oriented language does inheritance in a different way. There are no two that have the same semantics. 
Um, another influential paper from ECOOP 88, Inheritance as an Incremental Modification Mechanism or What Like Is and Isn't Like. It's a, it's a great title. Um, uh, Peter and Stan Zdonek um, basically said inheritance is an incremental modification mechanism. And then they di dived in this paper into uh, a number of different variants of inheritance and how it supports incremental modification and reuse. One of the feelings that I got in retrospect was in the 1980s, there was a huge... Um, obsession and hype about reuse. That object-oriented programming was great because you didn't always have to implement something from scratch. If you saw something that was similar, you could just inherit from it and uh, incrementally modify the things you didn't like or you wanted to add. Which is not really the way it works. Um, and if we look at methodologies later, they take a very different, particularly uh, Rebecca Versbrock had a very different view on inheritance and how it comes into the picture. She said, think about inheritance very late in the process. It's not just a question of reusing code. And actually what I tell my students, inheritance is there for three things. One, it's for con uh, conceptual modeling, modeling is a. Two, it's there for polymorphism, so for plug-in architectures. And three, if things work out, you also get some reuse. Um, but at the time, I think people were focusing far too much on reuse. Interestingly, in that paper, uh, Wegener and Stonick um, proposed the principle of substitutability, which should look kind of familiar to you. So an instance of a subtype can always be used in any context in which an instance of a supertype was expected. That's pretty similar to what's now known as the Liskov substitution principle that was proposed about five years later by uh, Barbara List Liskov and Jeanette Wing. They had a more formal notion of this, but I think essentially the same thing is going on there. Oh. Now, um, I stumbled across this fairly recently. Uh, this was in a, um, uh, uh, an ECOOP talk by James Noble, and there's a, a paper by him called The Myth of Object Orientation, in which he uh, refers to this. I, the original sources are nowhere to be found on the net anymore, so I, th I consider that to be the, the basic uh, reference. So Ralph Johnson looked at all these languages and he had, I thought, a very insightful way of, uh, of explaining what's different between these languages. So he says that there are three views of object-oriented programming. Uh, so the Scandinavian view is that an object-oriented system is one whose creators realize that programming is modeling. The mystical view, guess which one that is, is that an object-oriented system is, the one, is one that is built out of objects that communicate by sending messages to each other. And computation is the messages flying from object to object. And the software engineering view is that an object-oriented system is one that supports data abstraction, polymorphism by late binding of function calls, and inheritance. So I think this sort of fits very nicely and explains well the, the very different views that we've seen uh, over time and also explains well the different motivations of the different language designers. I know, I, I find that pretty cool. Um, then, all sorts of object-oriented principles were being proposed. Uh, many of these have been taken and rephrased by Uncle Bob. Uh, but he never claimed that he invented them. He just repackaged them, and I think that's fine. Separate interface from inter uh, implementation. Open closed principle, which was proposed by by Bertrand Meyer, of course. Single responsibility principle, which uh, is closely related to uh, responsibility driven design, and object oriented methods start appearing. Starting around 1988 and moving on to 93, those were, I think, some of the most influential books that came out. Um, you should recognize a number of those. For me, I think the two that I found personally most uh, influential were the book by Rebecca Versbrock and her colleagues on uh, responsibility-driven design. Uh, basically, it says that if you have a well-designed object-oriented system, every object has clear responsibilities, and it provides you with guidelines and methods for, for doing that, for realizing such a, a partitioning. And the other one that I think is very influential 
uh, was Eva Jakobsen's uh, work on use cases. It's where he really provides a very nice methodology for getting from the user requirements towards an object-oriented uh, design, to making this bridge from the non-object-oriented world to the object-oriented world with use cases. Now, one of the things that you can maybe glean from all of these different books is a kind of a underlying subtext that not programming is modeling, but modeling is programming, or something like that. The other thing, which I did not believe at the time, is that it's objects all the way down, but not in the sense that Alan K meant, but in the sense that when you're really doing object-oriented development all the way, the full stack, you use object-oriented modeling for your domain and requirements, you use it for the design of the system, and you use it in the code as well. And you will find, it's not exactly the same object, but you will find the same objects all the way down. And I always thought, no, that can't be true. That's too good to be true. At some point, you're going to have some translations and mappings, and it's not going to be the same. But in retrospect, I think that actually really is true in an ideal world. And that's what you should strive for. Object-oriented diagrams. I, this is, I just spent half an hour collecting from various. Most of these are from Uppsala 86, just random diagrams I found. Uh, so dozens in the late, mid to late 80s, dozens of these different diagrams were developed and arrows going every which way with uh, classes represented as ellipses or boxes or hexagons or clouds, everything. Uh, so this was pretty, pretty messy. There's a nice anecdote from Bertrand Meyer. He was bemused and bewildered by this. He said, why are people so obsessed with all these different diagrams? For him, the best modeling tool is an object-oriented language itself. So why don't you just directly model stuff in the code? I mean, you can build a model. You can actually do this. Rather, you can just start writing your specification in the language, even if the, the code doesn't do much. So he, he, at least that's, that's his belief. And then he said that, well, one day he was in the shower and it hit him. Bubbles and arrows don't crash. That's why people like them. Anyway, that's Bertrand's take. So now we've had this growth of object-oriented ideas and we're getting to the late 80s, early 90s. And now we start seeing some, some splitting off, some different, different factions uh, being, uh, being established. So one of the things that you may recall is starting around the late 80s, people starting saying objects are not enough. It's not just enough to have object-oriented programming because we're missing something. We're missing notions of architecture. We're missing notions of uh, software components at different granularities and so on. Um, so this is the gang of four. And I think a lot of different trends can be traced back to some of the group or some of them individually, particularly the work on frameworks that started already in the uh, mid to late 80s. And uh, Eric Gama uh, was working on the ET++ framework, object-oriented framework uh, around that time. Um, people around the very late 80s, early 90s started thinking in terms of components and actually in the design patterns book, there are various design patterns which are, uh, uh, which are revolve around the idea of having plug compatible components that you can plug into and out of frameworks, which also led to a different notion of a framework. A classical object-oriented framework works by inheritance. You specialize the framework by inheriting. With a component-oriented framework, you develop components based on interfaces and you can just plug them in without inheritance. And then, of course, uh, in some sense, they were, it also led to the idea that programming has to do a lot with design patterns. Um, so this was one trend, that, uh, or actually several trends that uh, were related around that time. Somewhat later, starting, I guess, around the mid to late 90s, um, we have Kent Beck and colleagues who started this Agile movement. And... Uh, Interestingly, they're focusing more on the process. They're saying it's not just about the language, but it's how do you interact with the customer? How do you really get the leverage from the object-oriented concepts in a, in a very productive way? So Kent Beck, 
saying, okay, I, we didn't invent these concepts, but there are a bunch of best practices out there which are very useful and can work together well to improve this, uh, this iterative design and implementation together with the customer. Uh, so a lot of these ideas, so refactoring, for example, started already in the uh, late 1980s as a concept, uh, Bill Opdyke and, uh, and uh, Bill Griswold and others pioneered that. And uh, John Roberts and Don oops, Brandt, um, Don Roberts and John Brandt uh, built the first uh, refactoring browser for Smalltalk in the mid to late 90s. Uh, so a lot of these ideas were coming from various places. The testing framework came first from uh, Kent Beck and Eric Gama. Um, no, yes. Um, and eventually moved, uh, was ported to lots of other languages. Then another trend that came. So we saw that there were dozens of different uh, diagramming notations that were being developed in the 80s. Then in the early, mid 90s, uh, UML was developed at uh, Rational by the uh, three amigos uh, who uh, came up with a, a very nice balanced proposal that uh, unified a lot of other diagramming techniques. And that was eventually given to the object management group so that a consortium could standardize this. But then coming out of that was the notion that, well, you'd actually like to use this object-oriented modeling and use it to drive the generation of the code. So instead of having a software developer building a code by programming it manually, what you'd like that person to do is to build a model ideally using UML or something like that, or whatever. And then you have what I would call is a model compiler that automatically translates from the platform independent model to platform specific models. So this is the whole uh, model driven, model driven architecture, model driven fill in the blank movement that started in the late 90s uh, and was really driven by the object management group and led to a lot of work on model transformation. I personally think this makes sense, especially if you have lots of different specific platforms. So when you make a change and the change is well understood, then you can write a model compiler. If the changes are arbitrary, then you can't have a model compiler that knows how to handle them all. It really pays off big when you have kinds of changes that can be anticipated, like changes in the uh, in health insurance policies or changes in financial instruments and so on. You say, oh, well, we can specify these at a high level and then uh, compile them to lots of different platforms so that we can react fast. So if you have anticipated changes, that makes a lot of sense. Anyway, this was one big, another big trend. And then a more recent trend is uh, the dichotomy, whether it's real or false between uh, statically typed languages and uh, dynamically typed languages. Uh, so some people complain uh, or argue, ah, we are much more productive with all this, all, all this noise in our programming languages. Uh, we don't need the types and we have tests, they protect us and so on. And in the end you find that even in the dynamically typed world, people are doing a lot of type inference. One, for making their virtual machines or compilers or whatever uh, produce much more efficient code or they're using type inference to support the developer in a program understanding. So uh, it doesn't mean that types are useless, but uh, there are many different views of understanding what types are there for and how they can be used uh, productively. Well, I'm pretty much at the end of my story. But for me, I, uh, at some point I looked at all of the different kinds of technologies that are out there. You have APIs for component models, plugging components together. You have these meta-modeling and model-driven approaches that give you, tell you how to develop specific models and you have domain specific languages, which, uh, which can be used to express at a high level, um, a particular configuration uh, for a specific domain. Uh, 
And if you look at them, it's sort of kind of the same thing is going on in all of these. So you can think that a configuration, so you're getting from the meta level down to the concrete application level, you can think of an application as a configuration of components that are plugged together, or it can be a specific model that conforms to a particular meta model, or it's a script written in a particular DSL that expresses how that all works together. And if you look at all the different things that people were trying to do over all these years with the different languages and methodologies and approaches and so on, I mean, what I tell my students, programming is modeling. What you want to achieve, and object-oriented programming achieves that well. Why is object-oriented programming? So in any programming language, you're building some kind of a model and giving it a particular paradigm. That paradigm says, oh, well, it's a functional paradigm. I want to think of applications in this way. It's logic programming. I construct it in terms of uh, uh, facts and rules and so on. They always give you a particular tool to model. What's different about object-oriented programming? It's fundamentally different from other paradigms because it's not just a paradigm, it's a meta-paradigm. What do I mean? If you think of the previous picture, object-oriented programming works at a different level. It says to you as the developer, you decide what the meta-model is. You decide what the components are going to be, what are the domain concepts, so that when you program with those, in a sense, you're building your own vir virtual world and putting those objects together to build your model. So you build not just the models, but also the meta-models. So that's why object-oriented programming goes a step further in supporting this paradigm. Which leads me back to what Kristen said, programming is understanding. If you do it right, if you do object-oriented programming right, you lead, that leads to better understanding in the whole process and leads to application code, which is easier to understand. Programming is understanding. Thank you. Is this on? Yes. Uh, we have time for some questions and discussion. Discussion. Hey, come on. There's a question back there. Okay. Oh, two. One in the, ba in the back. Don't ask me. <laughs> well, well, as we, as Ellen told us, uh, Simla zero and Simla one was in sixty-five and sixty. Alan K. in fact read the Simula compiler in something like sixty-nine, seventy, and then understood what object orientation was by reading the <laughs> runtime system of the Simula compiler. Uh, Alan K is uh, writing to me that uh, I was working with uh, Simula in 66. Yeah, which would then probably be Simula 1, yes. Yeah. So yeah. it was it was not object-oriented programming because it didn't have inheritance, right? <laughs> <laughs> so okay. it was object-based th th programming. Thanks, I'll uh, revert back to him. <laughs> <laughs> there was one more question. There was in another the question uh, on the left there, yes. Yes, go ahead. Oh, wait for the mic. Uh, indeed, it was a great talk. Thank you for your words. And you. uh, uh, after the functional programming and then the object-oriented concepts, do you see any major paradigm shift in programming? A major? Yeah, uh, paradigm shift uh, from object-oriented concepts or programming. Uh, uh, yes, I think this is constant struggle to try and make programming languages better at modeling and make it easier to uh, to recognize recognize concepts all the way down the stack. And there are things that are definitely missing. So for me, one of the 
biggest things that's missing, the, the, the elephant in the room, is uh, in uh, that one of the most fundamental concepts in the design of any object of any large system is its architecture. And the architecture is not in the code. It is nowhere. It's in people's heads or it's in a specification. What we're missing is some way to reflect the architecture in the code. So that's just one example. So there are things that are missing and I expect that somewhere down the line we'll see better ways of addressing those issues. Making, making languages better at modeling. Uh, just a follow-up question. Here's the mic for the... So everybody can hear me. Uh, what is an architecture for you? You are trying to implement something for it, but, but I am not so sure what it is. Okay. Um, do you want the one-minute version? So what, uh, uh, what I tell my students, uh, architecture, I mean, there's the syntax and there's the semantics. So syntactically, architecture is about the course level design. What are the coarse grained components in the software system? But that's just the syntax. What's the semantics? The architecture is there for a good reason. It's there to provide you with uh, very strong uh, properties in the system, leading to non-functional requirements. For example, if you have a, a, a fat client architecture, the fat client, the coarse grained architecture says, this stuff goes in the client, that goes in the server. Why is it there? The, just the syntax doesn't tell you. It's there so that more stuff can go in the client so that the customers, the users, can get fast feedback and you offload a lot of stuff that doesn't have to happen on the server. So the application is more responsive and, and the users are happier. That's just one example. So architecture is always about the course level design and it's there to satisfy certain properties which are important for the success of the application, not just functional requirements. back there. Hello. Uh, just a comment on the issue of model. You said uh, to Kristen Igor, uh, programming is about understanding, but he was really concerned about the modeling, of course, also. Even uh, 20 years after uh, Simula 67, in the mid-80s, he was my supervisor, and he still um, was discussing what is really a model. We were sitting um, together with Ingrid, he was also uh, had a, Christian as a supervisor, uh, at home, uh, at Christian's home, for eight hours, just discussing what is a model. And we had the full table of different encyclopedia to really understand what is it. And of course, many terms of the model is it not. I mean, it's not a photo model or a car model. It's about uh, same structure, structure equivalence, and things like that. My point is that, that even 20 years after his language, he was still interested in find out, finding out what is really a model and what does modeling mean means in terms of uh, software development and programming. Yes, thank you. I d you noticed that I didn't touch that topic at all. <laughs> yes, I did. So. Yeah, sure. There are models for different reasons. There are prescriptive models for things you want to build. There are models that are descriptive, specify things that you want to reason about. Models can be there for many different reasons. And I think all of those reasons fit into the story. There's no one answer. One last question. We're on time. Uh, hi, I um, really appreciate your retrospective in, into the past uh, you. and you, you kind of stop at the modeling and uh, so and uh, I was wondering what do you think what would be the next big thing and uh, what do you think about the ideas on the software product lines that actually systems can be described using modeling but approaching it from the other end, you know, uh, looking at the models uh, and the family of the products from the point of view that they have commonalities and, uh, and uh, differences. So what do you think about this? Uh, uh, or uh, 
from your point of view, what's the next big thing in a sort of attempts to, um, uh, to improve understanding or programming? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, there are lots of things which aren't in programming language, as I mentioned, architecture as an example. But I've moved in, I didn't talk about my research at all today, except what I, my very first experience. Uh, moved a little bit away from programming language design because I'm not sure what to do there. What we've done instead the last few years is we've been looking a little bit more about what support does the developer actually need. So when a developer is working on a system, working on existing code, extending it and so on, that person has a lot of questions about the code and about what other people have done. But if you look at the development environments that we have today, they're not much more than glorified text editors. There are lots of various tools around uh, that can help you perform software analysis and so on, but a lot of these things are not very well integrated. So what we're doing is we're looking at a lot of these different aspects of what, what can help uh, developers about modeling and analyzing the system that they're working on and looking at the ecosystem, deriving information from that to help to better answer questions about what might be potential problems and so on. Um, there are a lot of things which are that can happen in a modeling environment that is missing in the code itself. Another thing that you, aside from architecture, which is not in the, in the code, is any knowledge about different versions. Uh, a single application is always written in one version, is refers to one version of the system, not to other versions, and also refers to one version of that programming language. The programming language evolves too over the time. That knowledge about uh, versions of the system and versions of the language and so on is is not in the language and maybe is not a programming language issue at all, but maybe it should be. I just have no idea. So these are some of the things we're looking at. So I think there's a lot of stuff to do, but I don't have the crystal ball. I've always been terrible at, uh, at uh, crystal balls. And if you look at things that I said or others said about what life would be like 20 years later, what I said 20 years ago, I said, way off target. So I've, I've given up on seeing, foreseeing the future. One last question. Oh, wait a second. We need the mic for the recording. Okay. Thanks. Uh, how important is the concrete syntax of a language uh, in contrast to the abstract c concepts behind them? What I mean is, uh, can a um, somewhat, somewhat awkward concrete syntax uh, be an obstacle when it comes to, to the acceptance of a language? I mean, the, the best example is sitting in the corner there. I mean, uh, James developed Java with a syntax similar to C++ to make it easy for C++ developers to learn the language. So if you look at what's going on in the language, in spirit, it's much closer to Smalltalk. So, and people are still frightened of Smalltalk today because of its weird syntax. I love it, but uh, lots of people are, are, are very confused by it. So yeah, syntax is important, but, <laughs> but I guess we'll hear more about that later too. Okay, I guess that concludes the discussion. Thank you very much. We have a small present for you. Thank you. Thank you.